Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, Keeve, your, your comments on risk assessment and more importantly, risk communication really resonated with me because that, that is an issue that FDA has been challenged in the past, communicating risk. So what about produce safety? There are no produce items that I will not eat. Produce is generally safe, and I recognize that, but it's also extremely important for the health of everyone's diet. Uh, produce safety, uh, well, let me, let me qualify that. FDA does consider sprouts to be one of the riskier produce items that you can eat, and that's not pro uh, sprouts' fault. It's just the way they're grown in um, uh, a nice warm environment or just the perfect environment for foodborne pathogens. But if you serve me sprouts in your home, I will eat them because I'm uh, a good guest. Um, <laughs> with no expectation of safety later. Uh, so <laughs> FDA, what do we do? It, it occurred to me earlier uh, this morning that I should probably give a minute to describe who we are and what we do. FDA is one of the, is, is the premier food safety regulatory agency in the United States. We regulate most of the foods in terms of safety, not just microbiological, biological, but also chemical, toxicological. Uh, we do look at um, pesticide residues, we do look at heavy metals, and we do evaluate the risks associated with those things when they come into our shop. Uh, and, but more importantly, we have the ability to stop the flow of those products before they hit the consumer. So that's uh, what our job is, and the way we communicate those aspects is important because when we're out there trying to poke around and understand these issues in the environment, uh, we have trouble getting data because people know we have regulatory power of them. So right now we're, at, we're in a, uh, uh, a regulatory and communication. We have issues with communicating what we're doing in, in certain regions where outbreaks are occurring simply because people are afraid of what we might find. Uh, I need to make sure that everybody understands we are there. We're the government. We're there to help. Okay. <laughs> Chapter one. So the produce safety rule, yes, that falls in our, our wheelhouse. I am with the Division of Produce Safety with the Center for Food Safety and Nutrition. This is a single unit within FDA that is essentially the F in FDA. We are foods. We handle everything associated with foods in this one building. Uh, well, we have research areas. We have centers for excellence. We have communication and out outreach partners around the world that do a lot of work for us, but we help direct those projects. Uh, so. Uh, whenever an outbreak happens in the U.S., we're there. Uh, we are there to evaluate uh, how this may have occurred, and, and, and there are very, very rare occurrences where an out foodborne pathogen outbreak may go back to a farm. But when that happens, it's magical because we start to understand what may have happened uh, to present those pathogens to the commodities that the consumers eat. And this, these data are exactly what, uh, what, what grew the produce safety rule. The produce safety rule is a science-based, feasible, legislative actions to help growers understand, well, they t really tell growers the bare bone minimum what they need to do on their farms to make sure that the commodities they eat uh, are grown in a way to reduce the incidence of foodborne pathogens from integrating into their food. So there are several components to the produce safety rule. Uh, Dr. Milner illustrated earlier that biological soil amendments of animal origin are a whole chapter in that produce safety rule because we recognize that foodborne pathogens may persist in, in manure. Uh, we're now conducting a full-blown risk assessment targeting the issue to answer one question, one question alone. What is the risk of using manure to grow produce items in terms of human uh, illness. It's a fascinating topic, but we, more fascinating is we realize how little usable data there are, there are out in the literature. So we have conducted ourselves, uh, in, uh, we have laid out the foundation for some beautiful work. Dr. Milner's group in Beltsville Agriculture Research Service has spearheaded a lot of projects of some of the data which you have, sh you have seen, we actually are using a lot of those data to create models to help us understand uh, what direction policy needs to go in in the future. Right now, we don't really have any days to harvest restrictions on the use of raw manure in, in your, in your uh, to grow covered commodities under the produce safety rule. So what does that mean? Well, that really means that if, if you're a grower, you need to continue doing what you're doing. We have conducted several, uh, we have facilitated several outreach events 
where we got growers into a room and around the country to help us understand the need for the use of raw manure. And it's clear, absolutely clear, that growers that use raw manure are going to continue using raw manure. They need it. They need it for soil health. They need it for so to manage their soil uh, uh, nutrition uh, um, value. So this is absolute critical need, and it's, it is a resource. FDA recognizes that. All we are trying to do is help growers understand how to use them safely. So that's my wheelhouse. That is what I've been doing for the last five years under Sip Sam's uh, um, uh, shop. And right now we're, uh, we're working very hard. We're right in the middle of a risk assessment to help understand these issues. It's absolutely fascinating what we're finding. You'll find some very good communication pieces coming out from us. Look for constituent updates on it. So um, I guess what I, what, I'd what, I, what I was trying to do in, to prepare for this is really get an understanding of what are healthy, everybody has a different definition of what a healthy soil is. And so I think it, that sort of was laid out for us earlier today. Healthy soils, by definition, is as, as all, the, all the properties that lead to uh, grown, the uh, production of healthy, grown, nice, big, nutritious crops. Okay. So that leads to another question. What are the differences between organic and conventional soils? Organic and conventional soils are managed very differently. Is there a definition? Is there, are there measurable differences between healthy soils? Yeah, I think there are. Uh, I think there are scientifically. I think uh, we, we've seen that in the literature. And we've seen that in the nutrient standpoint. We've seen that um, uh, in the physical standpoint. But the biological component of those soils are what, what we're interested in because comment after comment after comment to FDA, and I can read, I have probably 8,000 comments specifically state organic soils are a very hostile environment for foodborne pathogens. So you really should have a different regulatory approach for organic soils than you do for conventional soils. So, okay, looking at the data, we don't have any, really. We can show you that if you sterilize your soil with a methyl bromide treatment, you're going to massively disrupt the microbiological structure of that soil. Yes, you're going to basically sterilize that soil effectively. So any foodborne pathogen that might creep into that sterile soil might have a better chance of survival. Yes, we can, we can, we can see that. But de facto compares, comparisons between chemi, um, uh, conventional and organic soils are needed. We need to see those. FDA is in a position to help you understand what's happening microbiologically. We have several teams on hand ready to help you understand metagenomically what's going on with those soils. But I don't want to limit this to soil. We, we are seeing an increase in soil-less systems. I'm talking about ponics, hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. These things are critical for the production of commodities in places where you don't have soil, like urban environments. So, Nothing is without a microcosm. Nothing is without a microbiome. Everything has its own uh, microbiological structure. And uh, this is one of my favorite graphs. I stole this from Dr. Otteson, who's here, uh, here from uh, Office of Regulatory Science. She's doing some excellent work to understand on a microbiome through metagenomics level what's happening between conventional and organic soils. We're just starting to understand what the difference is. But we need help. We need, we need, we need um, partners to help us. Uh, right now we're in a capacity building mode. We have a lot of resources for you if this is what's interested to you. It's interesting to us. Um, so, um, so this competitive exclusion principle is very important to us as a regulatory agency. Right now uh, we're looking at a very interesting therapeutic treatment, uh, fecal microbiota transplants. This is something that's happening more and more frequently to combat uh, human diseases in your gut that are uh, ineffectively treated with antibiotics, right? So this is a fascinating topic. It is a regulatory, from a regulatory perspective, it's very challenging because we don't know quite how to regulate fecal matter. Is it a biological soil tissue? Is it a, a drug? We don't know. We're trying to figure that out. So right now, it's all experimental. Uh, you have to have a new drug um, application to, to do these kinds of um, t techniques. But hey, look, plants have their microbiomes too. What happens when you take compost and you, you put it around that soil base? You're cr effectively creating a fecal microbial transplant in the, in, the, in the plant, right? So you're adding compost to change the microbiota of that soil. You're changing the entire microbiota of that soil. But how long does it last? 
Well, through metagenomics, we can understand the changes in these populations. You need all these populations for healthy soils. Metagenomics is the way to go. So what I'm proposing to you is a, is a microbiome study. FDA is willing to help you do these kinds of activities. Uh, you know, funding is going to be quite expensive because uh, changing from a, a conventional to organic soil uh, experiment takes at least three to five years. And let's face it, you know, research takes money. FDA, I'm not sure we'll be able to help fund the projects, but we can sure help analyze it. And metagenomics might be expensive, and we can help uh, leverage those funds for you. So um, boosting the capacity for effective usage of compost is my goal. I'd like to give growers some useful tools. I'd like to give growers useful tools for how much compost they need to need, add, how often they need to add it, in order to maintain a healthy soil structure. There's no better uh, tool for improving soil than compost. And I know this from own personal, own personal experience on the bench in ARS. So FDA is supporting a compost. We'd like to move, see the industry move forward to, for growers, to give growers tools to use soil amendments safely. I'm not saying we don't want to, we, we don't want to eliminate raw manure, but we're trying to move uh, that culture from a raw manure to a compost usage because treated soil amendments uh, look better from a food safety perspective. So thank you for your time.